So today Rascal is joining us um, from Huichin, a word I learned today, which is uh, Oakland. It's like our Jijage Moya. So Rascal Ruvas, they, them, is a white trans mask therapist who integrates Dharma into daily life through an anti-oppressive lens and somatic focused approaches. As a graduate of the Dedicated Practitioners Program, a mindfulness-based stress reduction instructor, and a recent graduate of a, the Spiritual and Leadership Training Program at the East Bay Meditation Center. Wow. Rascal loves collaborating to share the Dharma and community. They feel most connected to Dharma and at home in their beingness when practicing in nature or tearing it up on the dance floor. Our favorite recent experience was was playing with giant bubbles with their three kids, partner and friends in the redwoods near their home. And I'll pass it over to you, Rascal. Thank you so much for coming north on Zoom to visit us. Oh, you're on the mute. There you go. Hi, everyone. Good to see those of you whose faces I can see and to know that the rest of you are present uh, in your own ways. Yeah, so that I've already been introduced, so I'm not going to do that piece, but I, I want to talk today about a theme. Um, we don't have to sit to practice. So what I'll do is just have us settle for a moment and kind of gather our uh our minds and hearts and, and energy here toward presence. And then I would like to talk a little bit uh, about how that topic arose briefly, uh, give some cultural context to sitting meditation practice as it's expressed most frequently here in the West, and then talk a little bit about reasons for exploring a wider variety of options for practice and, and then explore some specifics and then we'll practice with those specifics. So it's a lot, but I think it'll be fun. So why don't you just sort out, you can stay on screen or be off screen, whatever is comfortable for you. But just take a moment and just tune into uh, whatever you can know in the body. And if the body would like to move a little bit, allow the body to move a little bit. If the body wants to lie down, I don't know, maybe you're driving on the road and listening. And so whatever is happening, um, allow for whatever's uh, needed and possible and see if you can allow a couple of deeper breaths. Maybe just take a moment and feel into the way the body is supported by the earth. See if you can actually get a felt sense of the way that gravity is holding you close, tugging just slightly. And then with another breath or two, see if you would like to invite the different fragments and bits and parts of your energy that may have gotten distributed all over, all out in the world today and gotten hooked onto different things. See if those little bits and parts and pieces of, of, of your energetic being would like to come home to roost for a moment, just come a little closer to center. And then just check out your own frame of mind, no right, no wrong. But just checking out your own frame of mind and coming here. Is it like, oh gosh, I couldn't wait to get here and I really need a space, you know? Or is it a little bit dragging yourself because you've maybe been on the screen all day or taking an input? And so just checking out the flavor of mind that's present as we're coming into this space. Okay, so. You can just stay in that state and that let words that I'm saying wash through you. Uh, or if you would like to change into some other posture, that's the like, I'm listening to a Dharma talk posture that helps you do that, then lovely. Um, and if you're busy doing something while listening, you are so on point for this talk. So I want to give you a little context for this. Uh, I, well, it said it in the, in the, uh, the intro, but I have, I have three kids, um, and I don't sit a lot. You may or may not have three children, but for a variety of reasons, you may or may not 
uh, sit to practice very often. It may feel like a hard uh, thing to access. And I think we have different seasons in a long, in a long-term relationship to a spiritual practice. We have different seasons, seasons of sitting more and then seasons when it's harder. And that thing that used to work just doesn't work the same because things changed. Um, and I actually had a client just a few weeks ago come to me and say, I used to have this really great, consistent 10 minutes a day, daily practice. I felt calm. I felt grounded. It was really great. Then I had a baby and COVID and I had so many losses and now I just can't seem, I can't just can't seem to sit. I can't do it. And I've, I can't practice anymore. And I need to figure out how to sit down so that I can practice. And the response was, you don't need to sit to practice. Like we, we, we can support you to find your way into that if you need to, but you don't need to sit to practice. And so it kind of evoked something that I've been living for a while and then crystallized it in this way. And so that's where that, this topic is coming from in my life. Um, a slightly cheeky, uh, quote from, uh, the inquiring mind, uh, blog says it is not slow walking that leads to insight, but the absence of greed, hatred, and delusion. So just as a reminder, it's not the posture, the specific activity, right? Um, and this is not, this is not at all meant to diminish the power of sitting practice, just to remove if there is one sort of any psychological barrier to practicing. If you are a person who is thinking, I don't have time to sit, or I'm bad at sitting. Um, so Okay, here we go. I wanna share a little bit of uh, historical and cultural context of, I am I'm most uh, deeply immersed in a Western Theravadan lineage of practice that has roots um, primarily in Thailand and Burma, and then of course in India. Um, and many of you may have different uh, versions of different kinds of practices that your, your lineages that you're part of, um, but I'll, I'll speak to mine because I know it the best. So when I was ordained in a monastic community in Thailand, like people rolled in with their families and a lot of food and they would eat um, in, we, in a very ritualized manner, sort of once, once a day. And then you, you could eat, if you weren't a monastic, you could eat at other times of the day, but they rolled in like kids. The kids would like play in the dirt and run around with sticks and, they would help, right? It would be like cleaning. And uh, sometimes they taught English classes and uh, there was, sometimes there was chanting, there was sweeping, and sometimes there was some sitting, but it was not the majority of the time. That wasn't held as really the, the, the crux of it. There was something about the relational, like the beautiful chaos of the relationality of that space and the deep um, sila, like the ethical container that that space held for everyone that helped support a really awake, alive, interpersonal practice. So I wanna name that as like a, a, a really important center um, of, of the cultural and historical context of, of, of practice. Um, and, and, and furthermore, it was also, cons it, is, it is considered just equally part of practice to tend an altar, right? And, um, to, to make offerings right? to someone who's alive or to someone who's passed, to ancestors, that all of this is part of practice, is considered part of practice, not separate. Um, and uh, not all, but many uh, Western Theravadan translations of this practice have become in, much more intensely individual uh, and less intergenerational and more about sitting and walking quietly alone or together. Right, and it's gotten uh, focused in that particular way, and we can see how white supremacy can is coming right into that with the idealization of the individual, um, and 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 a, a lack of understanding about the wisdom and and depth of insight that comes from interrelating. I'm doing this a lot with my hands. Connection. Um, okay, so this is a cultural context. Is that that s some of these pieces are missing in the translation, the cultural translation that that we then in when we are practicing in in institutions and lineages that have a western translation we're missing that piece in many ways okay now that i've said that i want to talk to you about reasons to to not only sit right or to not sit when you practice um i think i'd like to read you a short passage from radical dharma have any of you seen or heard about this book it's by angel kyoto williams who's a black Buddhist, social justice activist person. Okay. 
So I want to read you a little passage. Uh, the title of this is Everybody Home. Um, it says, even with meditation. So it's, uh, let me see. Predatory capitalist greed has deeply ingrained a self-worth confusion in our psyche. We associate our value as human beings with our financial worth or other forms of tangible worth. Our relationships are governed by the shadow game of acquisition. We can never have enough. The result is a devastating disconnect to a felt sense of our own experience, a devastating disconnect to the felt sense of our own experience. And so then even with meditation, we can remain mesmerized by the elusive possibility of one day becoming the elite. So we may contort our bodies or fling our values into suspension uh, to try to achieve something, right? We constantly are then demanding something of the practice. Um, and so Angel says, I, I include embodiment practice to invite people back home to their felt experience, to disrupt the disconnection between head and heart, aligned thought, emotion, and action that a cons consumer society fosters. I believe anyone engaged in the practice of liberation must actively discover it in their being and having a body-based or somatic practice is a direct way to reclaim connection to our psychophysical connection to ourselves and to the world. So that's from a really powerful practitioner. Um, so that's a reason. Another reason is that there's so much adulting to do. Has anyone noticed that there is a lot of adulting to do? Anybody? Yeah. I see a thumbs up there. I see you, Lane. Um, yeah. If we consider adulting to be time that we can't practice, quote unquote, right? Then we're going to get boxed out of our capacity to practice. Like how much time, how much of our life are we surrendering to saying, okay, well, I guess I just won't be here for that. Right. I guess I'll just miss it. You know, adulting doesn't count. It's just this like terrible obligation, which maybe it is a terrible obligation, but one can still practice with it. And so um, by really expanding our, our sense of what it means to practice and when and where is an appropriate container to practice, it can transform our sense of spaciousness around there being a possibility of a container that we can actually access in the midst of the society we're living in. Okay. Ooh, reason maybe three. Yep. Trauma. So sometimes if we are, uh, we are living in a body that has experienced trauma in the past or is currently experiencing, um, either acute trauma or like acute, but chronic ongoing trauma, like oppression, um, we can have a big reaction in our bodies, if we are coming into the idea that we just have to sit still until it's done, we can end up feeling like we have to either space out and kind of go far, far away, right? Or we can end up with a lot of restless energy in the body where we're having an impulse to be able to move because the idea that we can't move is producing a, a, a felt sense experience in us that is recreating something that was harmful. And so if you are in a situation like that, I have sat in those states and been still. And some of the time, I think it was, it, it, there was some power to that and some transformation. And then there are other times where I feel like it really just sent my mind back down the same groove um, and was not transformative and was not healing. And I, and I was doing it because I was supposed to be able to sit still and I didn't want to be a bad practitioner, right? And so if there's something you're grappling with that's in this realm, it's really, I really want to invite us to think creatively about what actually supports you to have a spacious awareness with a sense of autonomy or agency um, and what actually supports a relationship with the body that you are willing to have at this moment. Um, so I, I want to say a couple quick stories about some teachers of mine. So my teacher's teacher, Ruth Dennison, really had experienced a lot of trauma in her life. And she uh, could both go into states of really deep concentration and then also had times where it was really difficult to access presence. And 
uh, arena, my, my teacher, uh, her student would tell stories of, she would be driving and she lived in the desert and, uh, out in Joshua tree, uh, her place called Damadina. And she'd be driving in the desert and she would notice that her mind was like, mm, not fully there. So it was wiggly. She was having trouble being present. And arena tells a story about how she pulled over, stopped the car, got out, and she went and she found a big rock. And she picked up the rock and she carried across the road and she put it down. This is in the middle of the desert. I don't think there was a lot of traffic. Then she picked up the rock and she walked it to the other side of the road and she picked it, put it down. And, and, and the students were like, what are you doing? She's like, I need, I need more input. Basically, I need to have something that tangibly tells me that I'm here so that I can come back into presence. And it's skillful means to use this because just the subtlety of sensation isn't getting through right now. She also invited dancing uh, in her sangha. I don't know if you know this, but she actually was excommunicated. She was cut out of the lineage because she dared to have dance uh, in her in her practice. She believed in embodiment so deeply that she said, I, I'm, I'm, call, call me wrong, but, I, but I'm gonna practice with what's true to my experience, yeah? Um, and for me, uh, when I, when I came into practice in a, uh, in my early twenties, I was carrying a lot of unprocessed trauma in my body, uh, and didn't have as much awareness of it, but I would get these feelings where I literally thought I was going to explode like all over, <laughs> all over the very pretty walls of spirit rock. I was living out of my car at the time, um, and had gotten some like youth rate scholarship and it was a funny, uh, it's a funny cultural context to be in. Um, and it was, it was really amazing to be there. And some of that I was able to work with by sitting, by sitting and understanding that I had the capacity to stay with it. That was, it was profound in certain ways. And it was actually very important that I ended up, I ended up practicing training in martial arts for a period of time. And that that became actually the most juicy and profound grounds for awareness practice for me for that time, because it was evoking in my body, a lot of the uh, felt sense memory, um, of what would come up when I was sitting and having to be still, but I could move with it, right? I could act, I could stay aware, I could take action toward, I could act in ways that allowed my body to release some of what was what was within it and to, and to feel strong or to sort of like track, because I got pinned to, I was doing jujitsu grappling um, at the time. And that became a really incredible grounds for practice and was profoundly transformative. And I don't know that I would have been able to continue with a sitting based practice if I hadn't been able to access some other form of physicality with a container of awareness, yeah. So maybe this is resonating for some of you. Um, okay, another reason, not all, uh, but many or some of us in this era sit a lot for work. Um, there are many people, um, there are many, there are many people who still use, use their bodies all day long for work. And then there's a substrata of people at this point that are on the computer or in meetings, we're sitting, we're sitting in order to work. And if you're sitting a lot in order to work, sitting may not be what brings you balance and presence, right? It may not be what lights up uh, that sense of awareness and delight of being, or like uh, just a basic foundational sense of being, right? It might, we might be like really tired of sitting. So if you're really tired of sitting, don't sit. Let's do something else. We can practice anywhere. So we find a different container. Um, Okay, one more, and then we'll talk a little bit about how, and then we'll do some practice. Uh, so another, another one is integration, integration, because if we are, um, if we're holding a spiritual practice as something, even in our psychological, my, you know, in our mind, if we're holding our spiritual practice as something that happens when we're away from other people, not talking to people, and not doing anything, it can essentially uh, it seep in there right? That, that, that is what spirituality is about, or that, that the insights are only relevant to that. Whereas if we are practicing and, and honor to sitting practice, so we might be sitting some of the time, but if we're also walking and doing dishes and doing childcare and, um, dancing or, um, protesting and, and we're bringing deep awareness into those practices, then the implicit communication that we are giving to ourselves and to those who know us, right, is that is that spiritual practice is for absolutely every moment. It is deeply about relationship and the world and action, yeah. And it it, it doesn't imply that sort of false duality of those things. Uh, Deepama, 
is an amazing, uh, amazing, uh, amazing practitioner, amazing enlightened householder woman in India. And she was a teacher for uh, many folks who, uh, who started some of the Western uh, Theravadan tradition over here. Um, but she used to ask her students, she would ask, how much are you sitting? How's your sitting going? And then she would ask, and how awake are you in your life? And how awake are you in your life? What a beautiful question, right? How awake are we in our lives? And she would remind students, awareness, mindfulness, isn't something that we're striving for. It's always there. It's happening all the time. We don't have to work that. It's not something to effort toward, right? It, it, she says, mindfulness, rather than something I have to seize, mindfulness is simply being with what is. And there's one of her students who actually uh, had a, had an awakening, as she would describe it, after receiving the instructions and practicing with them from Deepama to be fully aware of the sensation of her infant nursing. And it turns out she was doing that for hours a day. And so then she had this profound practice of, of focusing on a physical sensation and the ebb and flow of it and, and her mind and heart shifted. Right? And so I, 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 I look to Deepama as a representation of how we can be deeply um, kind, wise, and present in our, in our daily lives, working with what, what is. Okay. I want to talk to you about some ways to practice without sitting. And then I would like to practice without sitting. So first I want to pause a moment and just like do a vibes check. So are there questions? Are there things that are not uh, like not landing or that are particularly exciting or resonating? Sometimes it's hard to speak into a, a big Zoom group. So you could put something in the chat or um, you could show me like a thumbs up, carry on, or, um, or you could ask something or say, or, or share something, seeing some thumbs up. Yeah. You all want to get to the, the, yeah, you all want to get to the, the, how to practice without sitting. Yeah. Gabriella. Okay. Let's go. So. how to practice without sitting. I already mentioned adulting. So pretty much any time you're doing a thing that counts as adulting, that's a time you can practice. <laughs> um, but really thinking about, and, and I'll, I, so I want to talk about some content areas where you can practice and then some how to ways of how to practice. Yeah. So possibilities, um, cleaning dishes, laundry, uh, driving, I find driving challenging, but there it is it's still there. Uh, exercise, uh, chilling on the couch. Um, any basic taking care of the body, right? So feeding the body, washing your face, brushing your teeth, um, putting on and taking off clothes, uh, kind of any mundane task is a possibility. I, uh, I, I, I walk around with my hands overly full of lots of little things a lot these days. And, uh, as I was, I was just on the way in, uh, com coming in to kind of get settled for this. And I was carrying my pile of random crap and the, uh, and a little book fell on the ground. And this is going to lead into, a uh, a way of practicing a little book fell on the ground. And I've been practicing a lot with impermanence, noting impermanence. And something in my mind said, oh, like, hello, be right here. Something about the book dropping, like woke something up in me. And so then, and then there was this moment and it just happened. I was not doing it. Right. But it just happened. And I was like there for and the, the, my arm, like reaching and the like awkward feeling of balancing and like grabbing the book and lifting it up and putting it back on the pile and continuing to move. And it had a beginning, a middle and end. And then I actually think my mind kind of like, wasn't quite as present after that. Right. But there was this moment where it was like right here. Um, and so I want to speak a little bit about practicing with impermanence, uh, in the Dhammapada, in the thousands section, uh, which has a whole bunch of things about if you did this for a thousand days, it's not as valuable as 
this one moment of awareness kind of sayings, um, but this one in particular speaks to impermanence. And it says, a single day lived in awareness of the transient nature of life is of greater value than a hundred years lived unaware of birth and death. And so if we're practicing with impermanence, it would be something like something like this, where we're noticing the beginning, middle, and end. So if I'm practicing with dishes, then I'm lifting the dish and I'm noticing the lifting, right? It's the beginning of washing that dish. <laughs> there's the washing, right? There's maybe the rinsing and there's the setting it down and there's the noting of the ending of it. Or there's the noting of the beginning in the middle and the end of that mountain of dishes. Um, or I was, um, we, we went on a weekend trip with the family of five recently. And I was like, I don't wanna, there's so much work. <laughs> I have to pack the car and we're gonna do stuff. And I have to unpack the car and do the laundry. And oh God, I was feeling really like heavy about it, which is fine. And then this thought came in because I've been playing around with practicing with impermanence. I was like, oh, this trip has a beginning, a middle, and an end. And actually the packing has a beginning, a middle, and end. And I'm in the, you know, I'm in the beginning of the packing section. And there was something about there was something about it that just like released the enormity of it. And I guess just helped me focus on a smaller chunk in a certain way, but also just under made me understand that it just wasn't gonna last. It just wasn't gonna last. And then I had this actually kind of very interesting time where I was lifting, moving, and placing, which is the instruction practice for walking meditation with your feet, lifting, moving, placing, stepping, lifting, moving, placing, stepping. But I was lifting, moving, and placing a bajillion articles of stuff, family objects into the van. <laughs> and so then I was lifting, moving, placing, and it was kind of interesting. Um, and it was different than how I might have experienced it before, right? And then we'll have the beginning, the middle, and the end of the driving section. <laughs> Right. So even if the driving is kind of hellacious and the baby is screaming and the kid is complaining, beginning, middle and end. Um, and this this is what it's like. This is part of it. This is this section of the trip. So that's it. those are eight, like sort of microcosm examples and a slightly larger example, uh, more macro example of how you might practice with noticing impermanence. Um, we can also practice just noticing physical sensation. And so sometimes any kind of movement practice that you like to do is a great container for this. Um, and just setting the intention before you begin to come into as much awareness as you are uh, willing to be in contact with today uh, in that moment, uh, as much of the physical sensation of it and the constantly changing nature of the physical sensation is implied in that, right? But, but sometimes comedy is helpful for me to retain presence, right? But it's, uh, so maybe I'm like uh, lifting some weights or doing some kind of reps of something, right? And it's like, okay, impermanence, 10, nine, ow, eight, ow, seven, ow, right? Or whatever it is, or like, or stretching, right? And like doing these big, deep breaths and then noticing how the body changes with the breath. Um, it's right there. That That's not, not practice. That is practice. Um, it's complete, right? There's awareness ideally a, a non-judgmental or kind awareness, or at least an awareness of the judgment if it's happening. And then, and then the object of the awareness, you know, the body or the activity, um, and then an awareness of attitude of mind. Um, so I want to talk about this piece because it is so profound. We can be aware of spacing out. It's actually possible to be aware of dissociating. It's possible to be, a, you know, you can be aware of feeling in love with somebody. You can be aware of basically any state of mind, body, being that is happening. It is possible. It's possible for awareness to be there with that. And if we are allowing ourselves to be with the, uh, the attitude of mind, that might include, sorry that I'm harping on dishes. I've done so many dishes in the last couple of years. <laughs> I hope you all have dishwashers. Um, but no, I don't. Cause I hope that you do dishes. Cause it's so great for practice. I hope both things. Okay. So an attitude of mind, watching the attitude of mind. Um, I might be watching that I'm doing the dishes and I am really perseverating a lot about something that my co-parent said that really bugged me. Um, cause we have co-parents for our kids. Uh, and I'm not that present, but I really would like to be present. And like, I have this constriction in my chest. It's not that comfortable. Um, and I would really like to be calmer. And if I could just pay him enough attention, 
to the dishes, then I'll be calm and feel good. Right. So that subtly you tune in and you're, you, you try to identify what the agenda is. If I have an agenda for my experience, I'm going to reinforce my own suffering. It's a slightly different practice. If I can practice with the attitude of mind, right? If I can then allow mindfulness awareness to kind of wrap its arms around all of that and be like, wow, here we are. Now I'm doing the dish with the desire to, and, and not like thinking, we're not like making a whole list the way, like a children's book. You can tell I have a lot of kids stuff in my life right now, like adds on, like it's the pony and the doggy. It's the pony and the doggy and the cow. It's the pony, you know, that kind of repetition. You don't need to obsess over it. It's just kind of bringing it into the field of awareness and being like, oh, you too, right? Oh, distractedness. Oh, desire for more peace and presence. Oh, aversion to the discomfort in my chest. Oh, this, oh, that. And so then, then, then it's all just there, right? That's the beautiful interrelated chaos. Like we are like the, the monastery scene I described. Hello, it's happening in here all the time. <laughs> Lots of different parts of us having different experiences and, and, and interrelating in this way. So an attitude of mind is really trying to catch like the stuff that we might miss around the edges that's subtly holding an agenda or a perspective that we might miss if we just think that our goal is to be to, like, just be present. And we have an idea that just being present means not thinking too much or not being irritated or not be not being these things. Um, you can throw out the thou shalt not kind of categories with that attitude of mind practice and just be, it's just natural awareness. It's just, it's not a lot of effort. You're not efforting a lot. It's just there. Okay. Mm. So what we've talked about is noting uh, impermanence. So the beginning, middle, and end of things. And we've talked about awareness of physical sensation, and that could happen in daily life activities or walking to and from like the bathroom, et cetera. Um, and there's awareness of awareness itself which you can play around with. And if you're like, ah, it makes no sense to me, then don't, don't trouble yourself over it necessarily. But it's just rather than turning to the object, right? Like, oh, the dishes, oh, the water and the temperature and the this and the that, that's all the, the content of awareness. We can also just turn awareness back toward itself and be aware of being aware um, and, and let the, the, uh, uh, the, content of it be present, but maybe not. It, it's like foreground and background, right? So we can put the content of what we're being aware of in the foreground, or we can put it in the background. Uh, or sometimes it happens that we're not doing it and it just is. Um, okay. And then one more, because it's so important, is liking and not liking or uh, Vedana, which means pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral. Maybe some of you have practiced a lot with this at some point. I have a teacher who'd spent an entire year, an entire year practicing, noticing, liking, and not liking. That is like some real deep dedication. <laughs> and it wasn't just on retreat, right? It was like all the time, liking and not liking, because it clues the mind into some of this attitude of mind, actually, where if we're liking something, something happens where we're wanting more, or we're attached, and it can be wholesome to want more of what's what's yummy, right? Like that's not inherently bad. There's not moral judgment on it. It's just to watch the process of mind that develops. Yeah. Um, or an aversion, like I really don't want that. I'm really worried about that, et cetera. Right. And so you're noting not liking, and it clues us in to hold that mind state in awareness. And so that can be a thing that we pay attention to as well. Mm. Okay, I'm going to read you one quote uh, by Sayada Utejaniya, who's a Burmese practitioner. Um, and he really centers this uh, natural awareness practice. So if you're on retreat, you don't do like any standard sitting practice at all. You just like being, and then you're aware, which is a kind of a, a radical reorganization from the way a lot of retreats are, are run. So he says, natural awareness is recognizing everything that's happening without using too much effort. You need to watch all day long, but most people aren't in a state of concentrating all day long and you don't need to be. Meditation is for all the time, now, always, everywhere, not just to enjoy during a stay in the forest on retreat. Like, well, is that isn't exactly what I meant, so. Um, okay, that's enough. What I would like to do at this point is to stop talking and invite you all 
into uh, a, an intentional container for this kind of practice. So first I wanna honor if you came here tonight and you really need that quiet sitting stillness, by all means, please do your practice. There's nothing wrong with that either, right? So listen to yourself, sort out what you need. And if you would like to do this experiment in which we have a Sangha here together, practicing awareness in daily life uh, together, then we'll take, I don't know, I think probably time, how much time? maybe like eight minutes, eight or 10 minutes. So before we go into that, why don't you take a moment and just assess your location and what what there is uh, to do that will be a good uh, container. I wanna give a caveat. If you go and like organize the papers on your desk, it's gonna be really hard to retain mindfulness without a, 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 a lot more practice stability. Um, so you might wanna choose something a little more physical, but you do what you like and we'll we'll, we'll experiment. So maybe just get a sense like, oh, I think I want to, um, maybe you want to move your body. So maybe you want to stretch or maybe you want to um, lift something or move something around. Uh, maybe there's a, a household task that needs to be done. Uh, maybe you just want to lay there <laughs> or maybe you want to listen to music with awareness. Um, so just sort of sort out what's calling to you and, and see if there's something you do a lot of in daily life that you would be willing to give a try to right now. So see if you can get a sense of that. And if you're already out in the world, because some of you are listening and, and doing something else and whatever you're doing is perfect. You don't need to change it. Um, and then, and then I want you to sort of play around with a couple of things, see what it's like to notice impermanence, see what it's like to tune into the physical sensation. Um, so try those two uh, aspects of things. And then if you want to try paying attention to awareness or paying attention to pleasant, unpleasant, then play with those as well. Yeah. So that's the container and we'll all be practicing right here together and I'll say something to bring us back and then we'll have a little bit of time to talk about what we've noticed. Okay. So you can be uh, on camera or off camera as it feels supportive for you in that practice. Okay. Ding, we're beginning. really staying with the physicality of your experience, noting the beginning, the middle, and the end. Paying attention to whatever is interesting to you about what's happening, whatever it takes to sustain curiosity. Not 
trying to make anything in particular happen, just trying to stay with what is. Checking the attitude of mind. If there's any way that the mind thinks that you are or are not achieving the intended agenda and seeing if you can include that in your field of awareness too. Coming back again to the body and noting impermanence. Beginning, middle and end, beginning, middle and end. Right here, right now. This body, this heart, this mind. Rededicating yourselves for these last few minutes. No worries if it's a tangled, impossible disaster type experience or a lovely one. We're just experimenting. So just continuing to explore what's happening. Let's be curious. Let's go, what's up here? Where where is presence bright and luminous? And where is it, gosh, just disappearing out from uh, under my mind moment by moment? How do I come back right here, right now? wrap the vast arms of awareness around whatever it is that's arising. Beginning, middle, and end. Just another minute or two of practice.
Yeah, I'll be doing a chant three times to bring us back into the space of connection and communication. All things are impermanent. They arise and they pass away to be in harmony with this truth brings great happiness. All things are impermanent. They arise and they pass away to be in harmony with this truth brings great happiness. And one time in Pali, Anicca Vata Sanghara Upada Vaya Damino Upagitu Anhiru Janti Desang Upasamo Sukho little impermanence uh, song in appreciation for your efforts. So now is the time for interacting with each other, if you so choose, and me. Um, so I'm curious what you what you noticed, uh, if anything. And so maybe I'll start with a few humble noticings uh, so that it doesn't seem too intimidating. But I, um, I wasn't quite sure what I was going to do. And then I ended up playing with my child's magnetiles because... <laughs> Uh, cause I play with magnetiles a lot and, uh, because there's so much going on with the toddler, I'm actually, I was like, Oh, let me like practice actual physical awareness of this, 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 this aspect of it. And so things that I noticed, the temperature of the magnetiles, they were cool. Like they were cold. And I, I was not, I hadn't really noticed that before. Um, and that when I got caught up in sort of the imagining of what to build, that was harder to hold awareness around. And then it would kind of come back when I grabbed a tile or I could feel the weight and then the magnetiles, right? They're magnets. And so I could feel the wink as they stuck together. It's very satisfying. So those are a few of the physicality kind of elements that I, that I was noticing. But then when I got kind of into the envisioning it was just, it just took a different quality of awareness to stay, to stay present. And I was like, whoops, totally lost it. Well, here's, here's the weight of this magnetile. Um, and here we are again. So, and then at some point it just felt complete. And so I stopped. That's my story. Would anyone else like to share a very 